This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. I'm Jo Colan in the Netherlands, where scientists are 3D bioprinting living kidney tissue. And I'm Emma Keeling here in London, where a new test has been developed that could help detect dementia earlier. Our kidneys help remove waste and excess water and control the acidity balance of our blood. Loss of these functions leads to chronic kidney disease, which affects 10% of the world's population. I'm Jo Colan in the Netherlands, where scientists are 3D printing living kidney tissue in a process called bioprinting. Their hope is that one day, they'll be able to print fully functioning, transplantable kidneys that could help transform the lives of millions of people. Worldwide, two million people are dependent on kidney dialysis or transplants to stay alive. But demand far outweighs supply. Every day, someone dies while waiting for a transplant. Marcel Passard is one of the unlucky ones still waiting for a kidney transplant. The 50-year-old law lecturer had his first transplant for eight years before his body rejected it. So let's have a seat. Great, thank you. I got my first kidney from my mother. And you were able to donate your kidney because this is your son? Yes, of course, yes. So what made you a candidate for a kidney transplant in the first place, Marcel? So 16 years ago, accidentally was discovered that I had a genetic disease in my kidneys, which uh, basically uh, the nephrons on my kidneys uh, were not able to filter uh, properly. Dialysis is where blood is cleaned by a machine. What are the impacts on you having to have dialysis on such a regular basis? Usually after the dialysis, I, you are so tired that you are not able to work for the rest of the day. So I'm only able to work on the days I have no dialysis. So basically two or three days a week at a maximum. So financial, it is uh, also the challenge. Here in the ancient city of Maastricht, scientists are working on a very futuristic solution. Carlos Mota is an assistant professor at the Department of Complex Tissue Regeneration at the University of Maastricht. He's working on bioprinting kidney tissue in pursuit of a future where patients will have new kidneys specially grown for them. So here we are doing bioprinting, and uh, in this specific case we are doing bioprinting of kidney tissue. Um, we are trying to replicate in the lab uh, what is the filtration unit of the kidney. Our kidneys are made up of about a million filtering units called nephrons. Each nephron includes a filter, called the glomerulus, and a tubule. The nephrons work through a two-step process. The glomerulus filters your blood, and the tubule removes waste while also returning needed substances. Our nephrons are important. If they don't work properly, not enough waste products are purified from the blood and the body poisons itself. And trying to print nephrons is what Carlos is focused on first. It's an essential piece in a larger puzzle that he hopes will one day lead to the ability to print a fully implantable artificial kidney. In this incubator here, we have uh, cells that are being expanded. So we start with a very small number of cells and we have to make these cells grow in sufficient numbers that we can bioprint. So to do that, we have to mimic the um, conditions that are in the human body, so the temperature, for instance, uh, the oxygen level, and then we leave them for sufficient time for them to divide. So one cell becomes two, and so on and so forth, so that we have sufficient numbers to then study on the bioprinting process. What we uh, are trying to do is try to mimic the human body, right? So our body is a three-dimensional space. So the cells are attached three-dimensionally in what is its housing. Uh, with the bioprinting, we are combining the cells with the material that will be the housing. And uh, once we print, we let the cells to rebuild their house according to what they need. And in this case, a kidney house. 
Yeah, in this case, a nephron house. A nephron Not house. a kidney so far. Uh, we would wish, and we have, that's our main uh, goal, but uh, we are still, still a bit far from that. So I'll show you some cells. In this case, we have these cells with a special food that will make them grow and divide until we have the optimal numbers for the bioprinting. This is one of the key ingredients for the bioprinting process. So what are you looking at here, Carlos? So inside of this flask, we have what you see here in pinkish is cell culture medium, which has specific information for the cells to divide at this stage. But at the later stage, we give them specific information for them to become the structure that we want, in this case, the nephron. So how do we go from the cells to printing? So there are a couple of steps which we'll show you along the way. I will hand over the cells to uh, our master student, Gabriele. Hello there. Hi. So now we are going to remove these cells, collect them from this flask, and we are going to mix it with our materials, so our hydrogels. So material that is highly composed of water, and that will be our bioink. What is called bioink in bioprinting is a mixture of cells and biomaterials which we can deposit in a controlled way with the bioprinter. So what we're doing here effectively is creating all of the ingredients that make the bio ink. Yes, correct. And once we have the isolated cells, we can put them into the printer. Yes, we mix it with a biomaterial, with an hydrogel, and then we put it in the printer to follow up on the next step. So if you see this small oh, cotton-like... Yeah. So these are the cells. These are one of the key ingredients of our bioprinting process. So now we are going to remove this uh, pinkish liquid. We are going to mix the cells with our bioink, with our uh, materials, to put on the bioprinter. Is it okay? Do you like it? So now we are producing a three-dimensional construct with uh, our specification. So we instruct the bioprinter through that computer. Uh, we plan a three-dimensional object. It is basically like the home uh, 3D printing, but in this case, the difference is that we are printing cells with an hydrogel. So layer by layer until we produce a three-dimensional construct. So here we, here we have some printed structures uh, and we can check it on the microscope to see the cells inside. Yeah, let's have a okay. closer look. Has this one proven something? This one proves that uh, the cells uh, are evenly distributed, that we have a printed structure with relatively good shape fidelity. So to prove cell viability and so on, we would have to do follow-up assays or to test if the cells survive the process, if they are active, uh, and if they will uh, do structures within this material. So we can give it a 7 out of 10. Yes, <laughs> I would say so. Okay. If you have dialysis, you are not living, you are surviving. You don't die, but you are not alive. You don't feel alive either. Hello, I'm Stephen Cole. What's on your agenda this week? I know when it comes to news, you're sport for choice. So many channels, so many opinions. But it's time to step off the news roundabout, time to cut out the noise, get to the heart of the real story with a talk show with a difference. I'll be finding out what the world is thinking by talking to the global decision makers and helping you set your own news agenda. Remember, we don't just report the news, we set the agenda.
the world, a total of 50 million people suffer from dementia. By 2050, it's estimated that that will increase to more than 150 million. I'm Emma Keeling in London, where a new test has been developed that could help detect dementia earlier, reducing the suffering of patients and their families and saving healthcare systems billions of dollars. There is no cure for dementia, and impairment can occur decades before obvious symptoms such as memory loss. Jackie Gallagher's dad, Jack, was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's when she was 16, but she felt something was wrong much earlier. He got a bit more agitated easily, and it started to be if, if I needed him to come pick me up from a friend's house. He couldn't remember where he was going. He couldn't remember the friend. He couldn't remember the time to pick me up. Someone once said it's like the lights are on, but the house is empty. And that was really what it was like except for a few moments when he'd, you know, laugh or try to make a joke. And even then it would be more heartbreaking than it would be comforting. Jack was 66 when he died. Dementia is caused by diseases which damage the brain by causing loss of brain cells. Alzheimer's disease is one specific cause of dementia and the most common. So Jackie, do you worry about getting Alzheimer's like your dad? Yeah, I do. I wondered if you'd like to come along with me and try out an early diagnosis tool. A few years ago, I think I would have been too scared. And to be honest, I'm still very scared. Um, but I think I would like to do some testing and find out at this point. In Cambridge at Alzheimer's Research UK, Dr. Katie Stubbs tells me the estimated global cost of dementia is one trillion US dollars, and that's expected to double by 2030. So what is the advantage of early diagnosis? At the moment we treat people with dementia when they show symptoms, so when their memory and thinking problems are such that it's interfering with everyday life. So we're diagnosing people at a very late stage, similar to say diagnosing people once they have cancer throughout their whole body rather than at that earlier point. It's this knowledge of the biology that's going to be really important for this. So if we can understand what's changing and what's driving the disease, pick that up early and then create medicines that can alter that, that's going to be the best thing we can do. But if you can see those early signs, how do you treat somebody? What can you do to help them? So an example of this is a protein called amyloid, which we know builds up in the brain starting about 20 years before somebody shows symptoms. And we've created medicines that can alter this amyloid protein, but we're giving them right now to people too late, so they're not shown to be effective. Whereas if we could pick people up 20 years earlier and then treat them with these drugs, then they have the best chance of having an effect. So they might be removing amyloid from the brain or preventing it from being created to in kind of too high quantities and therefore reducing that down, reducing the impact of that down as well. Today, Jackie and I will be tested at the offices of startup company Cognitivity. How are you feeling? Uh, I'm, I'm a bit anxious, mm. but I'm excited. Hi Jackie, very nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Dr. Sina Habibi is the co-founder of Cognitivity. Fill this out. Human brain has evolved to be sensitive to pictures of animals. Why? For food or fear phenomena. We either had to run away from them or run after them. So if there is an animal in the picture, we become very sensitive to it. So images are going to be flashed by for a very short time, like this one. As soon as you see a picture of animal in the image, you press on the right side of the screen. If there is no animal, you press on the left. So let's do it now. Okay. Oh yeah, I can see. Definitely. The test takes five minutes. Speed, speed, speed. Very important to keep the speed up. Factors such as lack of sleep or diet can influence the results. The test is not a definitive diagnosis tool. It indicates if there is a risk. Perfect. Let's have a look. Congratulations. <laughs> you've completed the test. Oh, very good. So this is a performance you've had, which is uh, on the healthy zone. This is the normal care of aging. And people who score in the red zone, we are uh, tell them that they are impaired and they need to be seeking a further assessment. This is an interesting analysis and it tells you how long you took on harder images versus easier images. So with that we build a profile of responses that our artificial intelligence can use in order to classify you versus the historical data that we have. And that's a very clever part of the test. This is your performance, your accuracy, your speed, your speed maintenance in comparison to healthy 
uh, individuals and you can see that you're very much in that zone. Neuroscientist Dr. Madi Halak Razavi is one of the brains behind this new technology. How did this technology come about? Because it was based on your initial research. Seven years ago when I was doing my PhD in Cambridge, I was studying the human visual system. And I realized when we show natural images like animals to healthy human subjects, a particular part of the, in their hierarchy of the visual cortex is activated. This area also is one of the key areas that shows accumulation of a protein, uh, which is precursor of dementia. I then followed up that idea and designed a rapid visual categorization test, which particularly targets that brain area and a large volume of cortex, so therefore making it more likely to detect subtle cognitive impairments, ideally before the onset of memory symptoms. What happens here is... You the test is not about memory because contrary to what most of us think, memory loss happens later in disease development. So you've explained the science side. Tell me a little bit more about the AI side of this technology. So what we do here is we build a multidimensional cognitive profile for each participant uh, based on their responses. Like a neurologist who would learn by observing new patients, the AI engine has the ability to actually learn from more data. Whoa! Okay. Did you see that? Me neither. We'll slow a couple down for you. On every image you see, you either tap on the right or on the left, and both speed and accuracy matter. So the idea is, because we want to detect subtle kind of impairments, that's why it's kind of challenging. But after the first few images, you get used to it. All right, clammy hands. I think I'm ready to go, but could, would you mind leaving me alone? And, and if you could go as well, that'd be great. And then I just have a little bit of, little bit of focus time. That sounds great, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wish I'll come back to see the result. Oh, that'd be lovely, thank you. All right. So she was a little bit stressed at the beginning, uh, but there is a warm-up period in the test. And after she passed that stage, she's now used to it and doing, doing it very well. I wasn't playing it up for the camera. I was genuinely nervous. It turns out I'm what's known as one of the worried well. No one wants to know they're a candidate for dementia. Don't grin right. at me like that. Don't grin. <laughs> How was it? <laughs> it was terrifying. <laughs> I think my hands were shaking so much. I don't know. You, you tell me how it was. This is, this is the tricky bit. I'm very dehydrated, by the way. That could have affected my score. All right. Um, no, it's great actually. You've done a very good <gasps> job. Um, <laughs> I can smile now. This is good. This is so this is your score against uh, people of the similar age, mm. and you fall into the green part. That's so that's great. Mm. So you've had a very good accuracy. My speed's a bit down, isn't it? Your speed it? is slightly slower, but the overall profile is, is very good. Where's that red line, Said? That's how an impaired cognitive profile would have looked like. And so you're quite further away from that. Oh, I finished. How was yours? It went a lot better than I thought it was going to. How about for you? I was absolutely terrified. Uh, my hands were sweating. I mean, you look so calm. It was really terrifying during the test, but then I started to get so focused that I sort of stopped worrying about it. And then especially after receiving the results, it was a big relief. And what were your results? I was in the green. Oh. I was in the A-OK -okay for now. How about yours? I was also in the upper green range. <laughs> does this, does it ease your mind at all? It has eased my mind in the way of getting to see these new technologies firsthand and to see the developments that they're making that can help people who have dementia or might develop dementia or Alzheimer's. Um, and it was a relief to see that I haven't shown any signs of Alzheimer's yet, but I think it could really help a lot of other people and that has eased my mind a lot to know. So you're feeling good? Yeah, I do. I think it's, it's good that technology has this capability of changing lives in such a positive way if used in the right way like this is doing. The Cognitivity team still needs to complete the regulatory approval process, but are hopeful their technology will be rolled out in the UK's National Health Service in early 2020 and in the US later in the year.
How will your world change today? What happens here? What happens there? Or what you make happen for yourself? If it matters to you, it matters to us too. Your stories are the stories that need to be told. Africa Live. Find your voice. Marcel has to drive to the hospital every other day to undergo dialysis for three hours. It's an exhausting process. I have been dialysis for uh, three years now, and this is actually the only option to uh, stay alive. I need this to be able to function. And uh, without this dialysis, I will be dead in two, three weeks. So it is necessary. And the only other option available is, of, is transplant, which is not yet available for me. I once skipped a dialysis day, a approval from the, uh, the doctor, and I felt after the three days very bad from inside. Yeah, I need the dialysis. So the blood is leaving uh, my vein to the machine, and it comes back and slowly uh, with, uh, with the uh, first is the dialysis water, and slowly my blood is coming back now. Clean. You've been receiving dialysis four times a week for the past three to four years. Yeah. If you have dialysis, you are not living, you are surviving. You don't die, but you don't feel alive either. It's something in between. And kidney transplant would mean having your old life back. And that is something I very much long for. In nature, our organs are held together and shaped by connective and interstitial tissue, which acts like a scaffold. At Maastricht University, the Moroni lab is bioprinting scaffolds, which is a temporary 3D structure that contains the cells that can then mold and build around the scaffold before the scaffold itself disintegrates, leaving the cells in the desired shape. Tell me about the scaffolds. They're a critical part of bioprinting, aren't they? Yeah, scaffolds in general are a critical part of uh, uh, regenerative medicine. Uh, a sort of three-dimensional uh, uh, material that uh, is used as a sort of housing for cells, where cells actually can uh, sit and thrive and be fed with the nutrients that we give them uh, to uh, live and, and produce the tissues that we want in the end to regenerate. So the scaffold provides some structure and information for the cells to take on. That's indeed correct. So here you see uh, a few examples, and uh, these are kind of uh, typical examples for uh, recreating uh, bones, but also in this kind of miniaturized scale, this is actually the way that we can today uh, think of recreating a more complex uh, construct such as a kidney or a liver bioprinted uh, construct. For simpler tissues, we would typically use 3D printed scaffold for larger organs we would actually go to bioprinting, uh, which is the process that you have uh, seen uh, where cells actually are already into the gel, carrying them during the process. And I see you have some more examples up here yeah. to look at. Uh, indeed, for example, uh, uh, we can use the same sort of technology to create uh, blood vessels uh, or uh, vessel grafts. Uh, we can also use them uh, to uh, go higher up in scale for simpler tissues uh, uh, or simpler tissues <laughs> such as uh, a, a full bone segment. What stage is your work at right now? We have actually been able to uh, successfully translate uh, some of our work from the lab uh, bench uh, to the bedside, to the clinic. Uh, we have actually uh, transferred uh, a 3D printed scaffold for uh, the regeneration of articular cartilage, which is nowadays uh, uh, used on a number of uh, patients. In the case of kidney bioprinting, uh, uh, we are not there yet, but we have actually created uh, uh, blood vessels, such as the ones that I have shown before, we plan to use as uh, a way to uh, prolong the dialysis through which patients that are, have kidney problems, uh, so that these patients actually could have a replacement of their blood vessels that, due to the continuous puncturing are uh, wearing out so fast. 
So Lorenzo, what takes place in this lab here? So here we are actually in uh, the sort of end stage of our uh, tissue regeneration uh, processes. This is the so-called biochemistry lab. And that's where uh, all the analysis that we do for uh, understanding actually whether we have uh, regenerated uh, uh, the tissue of our choice take place. In uh, a general uh, uh, workflow, typically we would uh, choose certain materials of interest and uh, make scaffolds out of those and then uh, add cells, which is actually done in the room that we see uh, uh, after the glass walls, which is a sort of cell factory, if you wish, oh, where yeah. there actually all the cell culture take place and after a certain amount of uh, days or weeks, depending on uh, the stage of maturity of the tissue that we are uh, interested into, we take actually those constructs, as we call them, into this lab and then start actually to chop them up or cut them a little bit uh, into smaller pieces uh, to actually understand uh, what we have done. You're really examining how they're behaving in here? Correct, yeah. We, so we, we, for example, can see if the cells uh, have been happy into that scaffold, that typically uh, results into uh, higher uh, reproduction of the cells. Uh, they, they, they can multiply or proliferate. Uh, and whether, for example, they have uh, started to synthesize to make uh, specific proteins that are the proteins that are making the building blocks of uh, uh, the tissue we want to regenerate. Is it just a dream, the idea of being able to bioprint a fully functioning human organ, like a kidney, for example? Is that only a dream? Uh, today it is only a dream. Okay. Um, I would love to uh, be able to say that in 20 or 30 years from now uh, we will be able to uh, make the dream reality, but it is going to be a challenging path ahead of us. Uh, we'll have to see if we will have more funding available. Uh, you know, for example, if uh, national governments would be uh, willing to invest the same amount of money as they invest for a nuclear submarine, for example, yeah. <laughs> the, then uh, we might actually be able to increase the the pace at which we will uh, do our developments. If uh, I will be able to see a bioprinted uh, organ in general, being that a kidney or another one, uh, that would uh, enter the a, a first phase, a phase one clinical trial by 30 years from now when I should be uh, able to retire, I would feel very much accomplished uh, uh, of my contribution to this uh, field. That would be the best retirement gift. That would be quite a nice uh, retirement gift, yeah, that's correct. <laughs> But that gift may be too late for Marcel. Tell me, what is it that keeps you going? Because we've spent some time with you today, Marcel, and you have a very positive outlook, even though this isn't easy to deal with. Yes, what uh, keeps me positive is the, 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 the idea that uh, it's only temporary. Uh, if I hear that uh, it will take maybe 10 to 20 years before this uh, artificial kidney is replaced with an actual kidney which I can place into my body. I say, well, 20 years, I don't want to wait so long. I want to have a normal life uh, and I want to uh, feel healthy again. They, 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 they give me the strength to wait and see, uh, well, in the future and very possible the nearest future, things will change for the better, not only for me, but for all other uh, kidney patients. One day, I found myself in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean without energy, following a breakdown of the alternator and defective solar panels. That day, I decided that I had to find a solution. I imagined uh, a clean and intelligent ship capable of optimizing the energy mix that nature makes available to us, equipped with an innovative energy system capable of producing and storing renewable energies for hydrogen. That day was born Energy Observer.